Welcome back, everyone, to season two of the CPTSD podcast. So that would make this season two, episode one. We have a flow and a schedule, and now we are building up on some of the things we talked about in season one. So if you need a primer, you need somewhere to start, go back to some of those earlier episodes because we're going to start getting into some more of the deeper topics as promised over uh, season one. So let's get right to it. Thank you, Beth. (laughs) Welcome, everybody, to the CPTSD podcast. I'm Tabitha Bird-Weaver, psychotherapist, and I'm here with my colleague and partner in healing, Beth Pace, who is a licensed professional counselor supervisor. Today, um, we're so glad you're here. We're so glad for the feedback that we're getting on our YouTube channel and also this podcast. So remember, if you like it, let us know and subscribe. Uh, if you want to get a hold of us, you can reach us at uh, the cptsdpodcast.com. There's a form for you to fill out there. We are going to be talking today about a very relevant topic to complex post-traumatic stress disorder, which is dissociation. We're going to be talking a little bit about what dissociation is, what it isn't, different kind of the spectrum of dissociation if you know how to know if it's happening to you and then maybe next steps for what you can do about it so with that I'm going to kick over to Beth and say good morning Beth or hello Beth what would you like us to start out with today yeah what time is it where are we I'm on vacation which means that I have sort of lost track of the days today Saturday. And so if you hear my dog in the background, I'm on vacation. Um, Yeah. So I think that I think sometimes dissociation like narcissism gets thrown around like. um, Like it's a hot topic Mm -hmm. and then you and, you know, one of the things that we who have complex trauma love to do is diagnose each other and diagnose other people. So if you have ever found yourself with just enough information to point fingers at people in your life that you love and be like, well, you know, you blah, blah, blah. Uh, Years ago, someone told me that their, um, their partner made them take an inverted narcissism quiz. And I was like, man, (laughs) (laughs) it's also okay to look at anybody that's like, you're a blah, blah, blah. And be like, I'm going to stop you there. Uh, we have a turn of phrase in in like 12 step uh, literature where they say like, don't take my inventory. If I didn't ask you to take an inventory of my internal processes, likely I didn't, I don't want you to do it. So dissociation, I think where we, we will ought to start is what it is and what it isn't, mm-hmm. um, especially because you can, um, you can, you can get enough information on the internet to get a little freaked out, you know, back in the old days when, um, you you would click clack around WebMD around mystery symptoms and find yourself at the end of like, oh, that's it then. Okay, this then this is it. Um, dissociation is a coping strategy, mm-hmm. just like so many of the things we talk about in this podcast. And then so what we mean is that we're going to honor it and respect it, uh, help make sense of it. So you could bring compassion to how you want to change versus um being flipped out because you diagnose yourself and you have yet again found another way to beat yourself over the head with a stick of self-judgment. We don't have to do that. So when you um, when you think about like common misconceptions about dissociation, what comes to your mind first and foremost, or what are some of the things that come to mind for you? Um, at, for me, the thing that I think I hear is that uh, people are just absolutely in like comatose, right? Catatonic. Nothing going on there, right? Catatonic. And um, that is 100% not dissociation, right? So I think that that's the biggest one is that there's some, there's an element of severity that people expect with dissociation that does not have to be present for it to impact your daily life. Right. 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 So Um, that's another about you. Yeah. uh, Multiple personalities. Yeah. This idea that there's like you who uh, 
can gamble for hours on end and sh and you know she goes by sandra and then who you are uh when you go to work is like business cat like that's not really it um in the way that the film sybil or you know the the sensationalized idea that someone has quote unquote multiple personalities and that one hand does not know what the other is doing that makes for a really great movie and in some very um extreme extreme trauma circumstances it's not really out of the realm of possibility but it's not the only way for dissociation to manifest itself in complex uh post traumatic stress thereby one of the things, you know, folks with CPTSD or with complex trauma also love to do is go, well, whatever I've got isn't bad enough to be bad. So it must just mean that I'm weak and I got to figure it out by myself instead of going to get help. Yeah. So yeah. there's, we, we do both. We love to mm -hmm. diagnose ourselves and others um, and like wag a finger. And then we love to go, well, there isn't really anything wrong with me because that's what trauma really looks like that's what dissociation really looks like so then I must not have that so then it just means that I'm I'm weak I'm lazy and that's why I can't put my life back together yeah yeah I mean we'll go right to those old ways of being minimizing ourselves dismissing our needs our desires our experiences and then that inner critic that judge that was placed there to just underscore the ways that we are not enough Right. And give you a list of why that's true evidence. And yeah. um, and the bottom line is, I mean, what you're talking about, dissociative identity disorder, that is real. But it's like 2% yeah. of the population have that. Right. Um, and if you want to watch an interesting, uh, you know, series on dissociative identity disorder, the uh, Divided States of Terra on Netflix was really an interesting approach. It documents somebody coming off medication and what that looks like. So long story more to what we're talking about today. For you, it is unlikely that you have dissociative identity disorder unless you were having huge gaps of time that are gone or you'll be in a supermarket and someone will call you by a different name. I mean, right. unless you're getting really alarming symbols or signals like that, it's right. more likely that you've got the run of the mill dissociation that we're talking about. Which, by the way, run of the mill is not dismissive. It is life altering. Well, or or think about run of the mill in this way, where like most of the folks that find our podcast are um, on a smartphone of some kind and have you know the cognitive capacity to do an internet search to find it, uh, which means that dissociate dissociation for you you who we are talking to out in the world listening to this has been very functional, meaning yes. that it has helped you be high functioning. Um, and so, right. So, so far we've talked about what it's not, or like these kind of cultural considerations of somebody being like, well, if I'm not, um, if I, if I'm not, if I'm not, uh, big memory gaps, people thinking I'm, I'm somebody else coming to, from a, a massive span of time that you cannot account for. Right. And, uh, you know, in that example, being in the casino, having gambled for 72 hours, having no idea how you got there. Right. Um, and usually people in your life or otherwise are already starting to tell you that they're worried about you. Um, so now let's talk, because I think we've talked a lot about like where dissociation comes from as it relates to uh early childhood trauma, the nervous system, the brain. Um, but in brief, if you think about fight, flight, freeze, or fawn, um, you can, you can do some internet searches on that. Um, if you're, if you're stuck in time because you're a little body or you're in a lot of danger, um, and your body is undergoing, um, the painful experience of, whatever is the trauma, whatever is the uh, stress, the chronic stress, you, you do the best that you can to leave that painful body or forget that it ever happened. And so go back into some earlier episodes. If you need more information, we do talk about how, how fight or flight, what's happening in your nervous system, being really flooded and then needing to shut it off. Mm -hmm. uh, today, I think we're going to talk more about what's it like for you as an adult. 
Right. And uh, just a reminder in that beautiful summary you just did that one, one of the things that's happening during trauma where we get dissociative fragmentation or splitting, as other people might call it, is that literally what's happening separates the left and right hemispheres of your brain, also the top and bottom hemispheres of your brain. And so you're literally storing information in different pieces which is why it is so convenient to dissociate because if you don't want to think about that one, you can just go into the other way of being around your trauma, say around triggers or things like that. So great summary. Please do go back and listen to those episodes. If you haven't, there is a wealth of information there to help you get grounded in your life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so there's what we think it is. And then let's, I'm going to talk about some of the things I've seen in my practice. And then maybe you can, you can fill in the gaps also. Um, uh, We've talked about this in past episodes too. The idea that you, you go to therapy and your therapist is like, um, try this, try this, try this. And you're like, yeah, okay, I'm going to try this. Uh, And then the time comes for you to use your voice to articulate to your partner the thing you would like them to do. And you're, you're like, okay, I've got my assertive communication script. I'm ready. And then the time comes, um, there's like what, you know, you want to say, and I'm going to talk about this. Like we talk a lot about what's stored in the body and the time it has come for you to, um, speak it. And you've got poo brain. That's not a (laughs) clinical term, right? All of a sudden, everything that you like knew you needed to say is not there for you. Um, If you want to think about things from like a scale, if you're at a four of agitation, maybe you can get those words out of your mouth. But if you're at an eight, your nervous system is going to take over for you and do whatever it needs to quote unquote, protect you. Um, survival over thriving. So in a healthy relationship, you want to tell someone how you feel so that they aren't unwittingly trampling all over your boundaries. That's a big complaint for folks that love uh, those with CPTSD is like, I want you to tell me how you feel. And the other person's like, wow, I can't deal. Right. Complete overwhelm when you ask me questions like that. (laughs) Right. Or I don't know. I I have disconnected. I have dissociated from my sensorial life, my emotional life. So when you ask me that, all I'm getting is I'm in trouble. I can't stop, be still and dip down into, um, into how I feel and then safely feel safe enough to articulate that coming out of my mouth. Um, so these, the reason I discovered that I needed to understand trauma related dissociation is because I would have clients who could quote unquote, perform well in session with me. Mm -hmm. So for that hour, um, the things we're talking about makes a lot of sense. Nothing is particularly threatening because they're having a conversation with someone that they're paying who has a vested interest in, um, understanding them and making things safe, but then they leave Um, they leave that hour and the skills don't translate. And that was when I started to understand uh, because of kind of ever deepening skill set that dissociation is also a thief of your capacity to show up as your authentic self. Yes. Yes. Oh, and boy, it hurts to be robbed of that, doesn't it? Well, and it's confusing. So it's so frightening in the same way that I've worked with folks with addiction and uh, Dr. Laurel Parnell has said she would call this, she would call addiction, uh, not denial when someone who's like, I don't see that this is a problem. She's like, it's not denial. It's dissociation Mm -hmm. that a central nervous system depressant or a central nervous system stimulant. That's going to like help you aid and abet splitting away from certain parts of yourself. Yes. Um, the part of you that all of a sudden can get their needs met because they've been drinking or the part of you that all of a sudden can like say how they feel in a, in a stimulant induced rage, um, that it's dissociation, not denial. I might've lost the thread. I'm going to try to come back. Uh, here we go. It's frightening to lose your authentic self. Mm -hmm. So it would be easier for the critic to chime in and say, you wanted to get that drunk. 
you, you, you knew what you were, you knew what you needed to say to your partner and you just didn't do it because you're weak or because, or better yet, because they're too scary, right? Mm -hmm. We can, we can send it out just as well as we can take it in and go, the reason, the reason that I uh, can't use my words when I'm in conflict is because I'm victimized. It's not because I freeze and dissociate. Ooh, that is a messy trap to fall into. It sure is, especially when both things are true. Because <laughs> as we as right, because we know that those of us who have had trauma ongoing, especially, tend to end up in similar situations where we learned all of those ways of being and coping. And so when somebody is verbally abusing you, you are being victimized and you also may be dissociating, which would not give you the presence of mind to be like. I'm worth more than this kind of treatment. You can't talk to me like that. Goodbye. <laughs> right? Or, or apply to your own situation. And so right. if you're in one of those situations where it's confusing, yeah, this is going to be hard. This is a skill to practice. Start trusting your own experience above what your partner is telling you. Word. Yeah. Well, and so as I say, right, it's one thing. So there's, again, everything's on a spectrum. Everything is about discernment. You might have someone who's like, please go to therapy, Right. please tell me how you feel. And you're still kind of in this story where you're like, this person is dangerous and hurtful and harmful. And the only reason that I blank is because they blank. Okay, that's one thing. Right. Whereas part of, part of trauma-related dissociation also means that your threshold for insane stuff is a lot higher. Yeah. And I'm not using insane as like an ableist term. I'm talking about hot burning dumpster fire type stuff where like you because you have an extraordinarily high threshold for pain because you dissociate can find yourself in a hot burning dumpster fire and going do you smell something right you hot in here because someone else who has a lower threshold would be like whoa holy smokes and hop out of there whereas for you you're like feels pretty familiar yeah seems pretty, seems pretty, uh, par for the course. Mm-hmm. So, um, if you think about if your threshold for, um, if your boiling point is different than someone who has not been chronically traumatized, uh, by whatever are the circumstances that led them there, those folks, um, will have someone like call them stupid or uh, kick them out of bed and then pretend like they didn't do it. And they'll go, well, I'm out of here. I'm never going to let you do that again. Yeah. But if you're someone who has managed to forget that your dad screamed at you and your siblings the night before, cause he's making you pancake pancakes that next morning, when that partner goes, I didn't kick you out of bed. That's crazy. Why would anybody do that to anybody else? And you go, you know, my body is definitely telling me that that's what happened, but it's so much easier to leave the truth because my attachment to you is supersedes my authentic self and my safety. So you can actually get into a habit neurologically, physically, mentally, where then you are attractive to and you are attracted by dangerous people because you've got an extraordinarily high threshold for things that are totally nuts. Yeah. And it feels normal. Yep. Mm-hmm. Or, or it feels like something. So beyond just yeah. normal, if you're someone yeah. who has a hard time having, um, experiencing the ebb and flow, the ups and downs, the dips of your emotional life, um, and this, this is back to like, our, where, where are the victims? Where are the volunteers? How much of this is your trauma patterning? So if, if I sound like a jerk, go back to some earlier episodes where all Tab and I are doing is being like, we love you. We want you. Yeah. We, we still love, feel we that way. That we do. We love you so much. <laughs> we to tell you the truth. That's right. Right. And, and the so, truth is some of it's stuff that happened to you. Some of it's stuff you're doing to yourself. Amen. Well, so, so if you need chaos to feel alive, right. That when somebody is like, just comes and knocks on my door and is like, Hey, I'm pretty stable. Can I just love you up and treat you well? 
And if you are kind of addicted to chaos, I hate to put it that way, but that's when we start talking about like codependency and love addiction and stuff like that. Um, if you're addicted to that sort of, uh, roller coaster. Um, I maybe have said this in a podcast before they did some functional MRIs of like a brain thinking about, you know, their like codependent love qualifier and a brain on cocaine. And you know what? They light up in the same place. What's fun about cocaine isn't the up. It's also the down and the twists and the turns. So when somebody that's usually the time where someone will come in and, um, realize they need help is because they're like, I told myself I would never get into a relational circumstance with someone like this again. And and here I am again. And I told myself I didn't want to do this very same thing. And I thought I picked somebody different based on my past experience. And here I am in the same spot. Mm -hmm. And that's when we do have to talk about dissociation is because the cues, the signs might have been there early. But if you are someone, if you've ever seen that cartoon strip of the dog who's drinking his coffee, wearing a hat in a room that's on fire and he just keeps going, this is fine. Yeah, this is fine as his little face is melting off. That's kind of what it's like to be in uh, excruciating circumstances, but not be tapped into the pain messages your body and your mind and your heart and your spirit are trying to give to you. So Mm -hmm. that's what I mean when I say dissociation. Yeah. And I mean, I'm not sure what our next phase that we're going to be talking about is. So I'm just going to drop this idea right here and maybe it'll lead to something. The number one thing that keeps people trapped in PTSD and CPTSD is avoidance. Mm. Number Mm. one, hands Mm. down. And guess what dissociation serves to do? It helps us avoid. So Beth, you were just talking about patterns in relationships. That happens in other places too. If you find yourself thinking things like, I just need to get out of this town and start over and then I'll be happy. You're dissociating in your life. If you find yourself saying things like, I don't know how I'm consuming so much TV. I I want to get up and do something in the evening, but all I do is binge watch stuff I don't even like. Or I was in an Instagram scroll hole yes. for like four hours. I was doom scrolling on the news for four hours. Yes. And food and exercise and anything that you can overdo to not be present is a function of dissociation. Absolutely. And that's when people start to go, oh, shoot. So like if the penny feels like it's dropping for you right now, good. Take a breath. Take a breath. We're here. Um, Also, because like, think about unthawing from frostbite, okay? Your toes are numb. Mm. You know you could lose them. But to bring the bring the senses back online is gonna hurt. But the thing that we keep saying in this podcast is little by little, you don't have to wake up tomorrow and be someone that you don't know, that mm-hmm. you don't understand. So you are not this sort of like have it your way, Burger King order type um, treatment it's it's like no you may just notice that you um you are like disappearing into a fog and you can look at the person you're talking to and go i need to take a second and that that's a massive step because here's what also happens is the um dissociation also if you are you if you're the person who feels very conflict avoidant in your relationships and you think that's because you're the good one um the good one that the people who love you are like leaning harder on you to get you to show up which is more and more frightening for you um and so then your dissociation is fomenting this pattern, they're sort of um, leaning on controlling. And so what happens for a lot of my, frankly, uh, male socialized clients is they'll come in and they'll say, my partner is asking me to tell them how I feel. And I, I, I honestly just can't get anything out of my throat. Yeah. 
And then we trace the thread back and uh, there's a long history of getting the message that how they feel didn't matter. And now all of a sudden someone's asking them to do the complete opposite of what um, they have always done which is stuff how they feel to make space for where someone else is, where someone else feels. Um, so what has, let's see. Yeah. I want, I think talking about avoidance is a really good idea. Um, if you want more resources, uh, go ahead. I just want to pop back in and say what you just said is also true for those of us, including me who are conflict seeking, right? Because I, I was a conflict seeking person my whole life, because in my house, if there was an intensity behind something, you better find out where the shoe's going to drop. So for me, when I married my husband, who is like the sweetest pumpkin pie, he is nice and, and a little conflict avoidant. So beware, we attract each other. Like peanut butter and jelly. Okay. And we feel so yeah. good. Just like that. But for me, I was scared the first couple of years because he would just be like, okay, and flexible. And I needed to go toe to toe to know where I was, where he was, and that we were together. And so I had to learn how to not seek conflict. I wasn't always starting fights, but there was always intensity, if that makes sense. Gab, I... I it doesn't make sense. A lot of things are starting to make sense. I'm the runner away. -er. I'm the uh, runner one. So like, as you're like, I'm this way. And I'm just like, I can, I can feel myself shrinking at the same time as being like, really? I mean, clearly both Tabitha and I have done a fair amount of our own work as right. it relates to, uh, and because we're business partners, we have to have, you know, courageous conversations with each other often. We do. Um, but that, yeah, what I, what I began to notice about myself, and this is something that's in process guys. So like Tab and I haven't arrived somewhere that we get to like float on the, the pink cloud of enlightenment and tell you about yourselves, um, that I just have realized that my conflict avoidance plus intellectualization, right. Which, yeah. you know, <laughs> if you want to go look at like Freudian defense mechanisms, um, intellectualization and rationalization, these are like gifts to the um to the dissociated child, to the dissociated mind. Um, so then if I can approach something from an intellectual place, um, I'll even try to convey how I feel to you in a package that's so tenderly considerate of how you're gonna receive it so you don't get mad at me, that my um the the message that I need to get across about how I feel is lost. Mm. And then somebody goes, why didn't you tell me that the first time? And I'm like, gosh, I really thought I did. Um, and so unthawing from dissociation means you have to hit your own growth edge and Pema Chodron, the Buddhist nun. Um, if you're, if you're in a place where you, you want more support on how to be mindful, she's got some really great audio books, um, start where you are as one of them. Um, but the that, she talks about, that she talks about how for some people it is actually sitting still when what they want to do is lean in and for other people what it is is actually speaking up when they want to be quiet so wherever you have to hit your own avoidance growth edge your own unthawing um this is what i also think about dissociation is um what's painful gets so distorted from what's safety creating. Yeah. So in a functional, I'm not sure I want to use that word, in an untraumatized life, mm. unchronically traumatized life, which is not to say it's not without upheaval. When you ask someone, which of these sounds more dangerous? Sitting in a therapy session and listening to your child tell you how she feels or snake belly crawling under gunfire to get to your drug dealer's house? Child, <laughs> the child. <laughs> yeah, right. which of them sounds more dangerous? Yeah. And it turns out that whenever it's like feelings, authenticity and showing up, a lot of times our clients go, that sounds terrifying. And the other one, which is like going into this crazy job as an ER doctor and removing foreign objects from people's rectums over the entire course of a weekend sounds less overwhelming than trying to tell my crush that I like them. 
I'm going to be thinking about that even after we're done with this podcast. Oh, <laughs> that, that, is, that is it. Yeah. <laughs> right up. Somebody said that to me once. I was just like, they were like, yeah, that would, that's way easier. Um, so mm-hmm. when we're habituated for chaos, that's what, that's what dissociation does for you. It yes. allows you to thrive in chaos. It can feel very stabilizing sometimes. Yes. Yes. It absolutely can. Absolutely. And that is important to remember because as you're learning and, or I love the way you're talking about thawing, right? As you're thawing and realizing that you've been tolerating things that you ought not be tolerating, right? You have been dismissing yourself. It's going to take some practice because we weren't trained how to do this or we were untrained. If you have CPTSD as a, you know, from adult causes. Right. And so there's a piece of being able to sit with yourself while you don't do it right. That is terrifying. Yes. I suck at it still. If I think I'm not doing something right, I'm like all inside. That's still stuff I'm working on. So the key here is to number one, keep trying. Number two, be kind to yourself. There's a reason you dissociated again. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, and I will also say that, you know, to, to tabs list number three, um, who are the safe people in your life that can point out your blind spots to you? Who would you actually listen to? Who do you dismiss? This is one of the reasons that we encourage folks to get a therapist, get into a talk therapy group, go to an adult children of alcoholics or other dysfunctional families meeting, go yeah. to an Al-Anon meeting. Um, nobody's going to kick you out because you don't have an active alcoholic in your life. That's like a common misconception about 12 step and mutual support is that if you don't have an alcoholic spouse or um, family member that you don't get to go get mutual support. And if, if the God language flips your lid, no problem. You can keep looking, you can keep looking. Uh, Refuge recovery or recovery Dharma is a more Buddhist based 12 step and mutual support. program and they will say for recovery from addiction of all kinds. And that would include, I would say addiction to chaos. And if your dissociation has led you to become addicted to chaos, claim your seat in a 12 step or a mutual support program. If therapy is not currently financially available to you, there's always somewhere where you can go. Cause I also think that like dissociation, um, allows you to be alone. Oh my gosh. And some of us need that so much because we were trained. That's what's safe. Right. 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 So, and so then you don't have to feel lonely if you're dissociated, you're right. numb, you're in a fog, you're just in your, you're on Instagram, doom scroll, scrolling or spinning this yarn as you're avoiding real life and going, well, as soon as I have a flat enough stomach, my life is going to really start off. Or like, as soon as I, uh, I, I, someone in my life, uh, described to me that like early in their recovery process, they couldn't stop buying new skincare products. And then they had just like tons of unopened boxes of skincare products all over their home. And the thought of opening any of them and using them was too overwhelming. And the thought of sending them back and getting their money back was too overwhelming, but they couldn't stop buying more skincare products as if one day, you know, you, that kind of, that burger, that order of like, and now I'd like to be functional. And all of a sudden it would be like kapow and a lightning bolt. Um, so, so three to, to tabs one and two, three, who do you trust? Who do you feel safe enough to receive feedback about your blind spots? Um, and when I mean trust and I mean safe, does, does this person have an agenda is manipulating you part of that agenda? If so, they're not safe. People who like to manipulate love to tell you about what you need to work on about yourself. Oh my gosh. And so, you know, those people are, um, an old friend of mine, uh, basically what he would say when he meant, I'm not going to do that would go, Oh, I'll take that under advisement. (laughs) (laughs) I I I say that's an interesting idea. That's interesting. <laughs> uh-huh. Might be right. And just keep it moving. So you don't have to let anybody that wants to quote unquote, take your inventory, but to what tab's talking about unthawing, cut yourself a break, understand. And what I'm here to tell you is there are costs and benefits to dissociating. 
if the costs have not outweighed the benefit for you, you're probably not ready to let it go. Yep. And that's okay too. You still deserve to still deserve support. Yes. And there are costs and benefits to uh, to unthawing and doing this type of work. What I want to tell you is one of them is not pain-free. That's the illusion of dissociation. One of them is not pain-free such that it spares you the pain. And the other one isn't excruciatingly painful such that it spares you the relief. You're just going to choose a different kind of pain. Productive pain or non-productive pain? Bingo. Yeah. So short-term mm-hmm. cost, long-term benefits, or short-term benefit, long-term cost. Mm-hmm. Avoiding conflict has the short-term benefit of that person not getting mad at me. It has the long-term cost of me seething with resentment about the fact that we never get to go to the movie that I pick. So many relationships in my marriage counseling practice are about exactly what you're talking about. Right. In so many different ways through life. Hey, before we move on, I just want to pop in two ideas. The first is I love the recovery referrals that you're giving. And I just wanted to throw another one out there called rational recovery, which has it's cognitive recovery. And so it's all about your thinking. It doesn't have any Buddhist or Christian underpinnings at all. In yeah. fact, one of their premises was, is if you use again or drink again, then you weren't ready to quit. It's just that simple. Nice. So they're online. So that might be a fit for you as well. And um, I, I'm so glad you said that because I want to, um, also the satanic temple has a, a mutual support recovery program. Right on. So, like, so, and they're, like wherever you want to get it, nobody, the, we, Tab and I don't have an agenda as it relates to where you get support. Just find someone who has a vested interest in you getting better. And that's the end of their agenda. Right. And, and therapy may be, and may seem out of reach, but there are a lot of online options now that have changed the world in just two years. So go, go do when you're doom scrolling next time, notice, you know, do a search and see if there's any online therapy available for you. The other thing is um, finding that person that you can trust that you're talking about, Beth, if you're in a very dysfunctional or scary experience in your life, it may only be a therapist that is able to give that yeah. to you. I don't, I don't know who's in your circle, but right. the point I wanted to make is understand that part of the suffering or the pain that will come is that that circle is going to change because as soon as you stop dissociating, you're going to realize where you're at a disadvantage, where people are taking advantage of you, what feels yeah. good, what hurts. And you are going to make differences. Like, for example, you might start saying to people, you can't just not show up on me when we have a scheduled date time. And, you know, whether it's intimate or friends, if they're, if you're getting ghosted, that's a boundary you need to put in. If you're getting abused, there's a boundary that you're going to have to find. And when you start clearing out the dissociative patterns in your life, those boundaries are going to be obvious to you. And your social life is going to change. And so I don't mean to be threatening with that. But I do want that kind of informed consent before you move forward. Like, you might find out that your friends are pretty crappy to you. And you deserve better ones. I don't know what you're going to find. But I hope it's more authenticity. And you deserve better ones. So, yeah, the way that I describe this to people, because it's a really unpleasant, um, you know, the... I, I don't know. Long story, short story, short story. Okay. I could do this two, one of two ways. We'll do the short story. Okay. Basically imagine that you're standing on what feels like a cliff edge and you can see the place you're trying to get to. Um, and to my limited appreciation, I, like, I don't know anything about building a bridge. I don't know anything about building a bridge, but the first thing you've got to do is like sink the foundations, which means that instead of just sort of like levitating over the rainbow bridge to Asgard, you're actually going to have to go down into the, the, the muck, right? That's where you start building a bridge. Not that like you could just sort of see where you want to go and levitate over. And that's like, that's pretty frightening and understanding your own depth little by little one step at a time is how you unfreeze from dissociation. So I, I set a timer about 35 minutes ago. We've got 
I would say like 10, 15 ish minute minutes. Um, so I would like to talk about if you're just listening to us, the internet will help you. Um, there's more you can do. If you start Google searching things like, um, embodiment practice versus what's wrong with me because if you google search the former versus the latter you can get functional help and information probably the first six things are going to be like what somebody's selling you and then the next ones are going to be like a blog post that's free and you can read it um so i'm going to start and then we'll hear what tab has to say when i talk about costs versus benefits or choosing a different kind of pain um do you get headaches? Do you have tense temples? Do you have tense neck and shoulder muscles? Um, does your jaw clench? Do you use a ton of caffeine? Like what are the ways that you know you are aiding and abetting, not getting into like a sensory experience in your body? And then you have to ask yourself the question, which is more painful? Because avoidance is not cost-free because if it was, this would be called the avoidance podcast and we would teach you all of the easy ways to do more of it. And we'd be like, have you tried drugs? But we're not, <laughs> we're talking about something else. So no, we don't recommend it. Um, but I, if you think about, and we've talked about this in here too, that like hunching over posture that I would curl into is someone was kicking me. That's a lot of what we're essentially shaped like when we are trying to protect our head from the pain we feel in our body. And back to that idea of like parts work from last episode, uh, the season finale of season one, you can talk to your tense neck yeah. and go, makes a lot of sense that you're doing what you're doing. Um, if you're ready to relax, I'd be ready to try a new way to support you. You can straight up talk to yourself that way because Please. unsurprising news flash, folks, you talk to yourself all the time. That's what that inner critic is doing. Mm -hmm. You're talking to yourself. So when I say like, talk to your trap trapezius muscles and people are like, that seems kind of stupid. And I'm like, do you, do you call yourself names all day long? Which of them is more imaginary? All right, you go tab. What do you think? <laughs> um, I think that what you're saying is pretty important to notice and that um, just to attach on another idea to what you're saying if you actually are brave enough to talk to your literal body, okay, neck muscles, what is it that is going on there? Mm -hmm. And you ask that part what it needs, or you offer thanks to that part, because it's trying to help you, even if it yep. hurts like heck. Yeah. Right. So sometimes like, okay, thank you for telling me. I think you think I'm in an unsafe situation and roll it out, whatever you want. Um, just acknowledging that it's trying to help you will help that part relax, especially yep. if it's a physical muscle. The other thing that I wanted to add in here, and Beth, I have no idea if this relates to what you're what you're actually asking, but I feel like there's this concept that's important, which is there's a difference between pain and suffering. And I really want to credit the Buddhist tradition for this concept, right? Um, I can't quote scriptures or anything like that, but the idea is pain in life is inevitable. You're gonna stub your toe. Right. Someone's right. going to say something mean to you. It happens all the time, all day, every day, right? Pain is inevitable. Suffering happens when we cling to the pain and make stories about it. Yeah, yeah. And so when we're talking about you choosing two different kinds of pain, really what we're talking about is two different kinds of suffering. Mm. And one is ongoing. What you're doing right now will not change unless you have to take act, you know, unless you take action on it. Right. Right. It's a way of being that it's no fault of your own. You learned it. So you yeah. gotta unlearn it. The suffering that comes with the work we're talking about is short because you've got to go in, experience a degree of the pain that you had before and then work through the stories you have about that pain. Yeah. So that terminates the suffering. Because then emotion, and then you learn, you learn on the other side of dissociation that emotions have a beginning, 
a middle and an end, as we've talked about many times in this podcast. But if you believe that like suffering is chronic, ongoing, um, the your lot in life, and we're not we're not necessarily going to get too into core beliefs um, today because there's not a ton of time. But as you were talking, and I'm really glad you said that. Um, the capacity to tolerate distress is not the same thing as numbing out and then being so numb that you've got to like light your own dumpster fire to feel something. Yep. That's so hard to watch. It's so hard to be in. I'm fairly certain that without going into too much detail, Tab and I can both nod our heads and be like, yeah, we have lit our own dumpster fires before. Yes, we have. I've had uh, who hasn't? Ones. But like, those are either learning experiences or you're like, hi, never again. That just no more dumpsters. And then the next time, you know, some hot, hot mess shows up in your life and you're like, ooh, ooh. And a hot, hot mess doesn't necessarily have to be like a cute, person. It could also be a nuts job, or it could be like overburdening yourself with obligations. You know, the idea of like retiring and then feel, becoming the, like the, the president of the chapter of the retirees chapter of like the art community, you can just keep going. And what we're trying to do is encourage you to stop. So when I say start from the head down, uh, the intellect is usually the part that I have to tussle with when I do parts work um, with my clients. This part that's like, well, there's nothing underneath here. Come into the library. I will show you my many leather bound books. And I'm just like, yo, but the basement where all the like moans and groans are coming out of. And this part of you is just like, what basement? Right. What? I cemented that in a long time ago. <laughs> what movie monster uh, <laughs> noises? What do you mean? And um, and what we are trying to say is, if there was a, we we honor you and respect that you're trying to protect Tabitha or that you're trying to protect Beth. If there was a new way to keep her safe without all of the costs, would you be open? Mm. So it's a negotiation, not necessarily a tussle. There's one more thing I wanted to say. Um, related to like how you get, how you get here. If you can just sit with yourself for 30 seconds, that's a great place to start. Yep. You have everything you need to sit with your own body for 30 seconds and take a couple of deep breaths. And your nervous system may tell you there's nothing more scary. If you're not, if you're not alert and hypervigilant, then you're not safe. If mm -hmm. you're not freaked out, then you're not paying attention. And what we're trying to do is say to you that you can use this higher order part of you to like integrate. Um, another thing we can talk about maybe today is like cook's hookup or the rubbing your sore points, like some sure. things you can do with your body that um, the tapping lady. Donna Eden. No, your friend who came on this. <laughs> oh, sorry, Miss Krista Dawson. <laughs> yes, our treasured colleague and podcast. I, I <laughs> learned books <laughs> book up from Donna Eaton years and years ago. <laughs> sorry, Krista. You know, the oh, no this, and I didn't set you. I didn't like tee you up for success on that one. When we talk about, so we'll make space to do that today. Um, before we wrap up, because we, we use it a lot in, um, in AIT, we use it a lot in like embodied somatic practice that when you're out of your body, um, it's not simple. It's not just simple to get back into it, but if you can, for a moment, do this with me, tab sense into the center of your hand, like what's in your hand and then see if you can like sense what that feels like. Is it tingling? Is it cold? Is this hard to do? This is presence. And it's not some sort of thing that's available only to initiates. Oh, right. Or if you wiggle your toes, if you wiggle your fingers and your toes, it's one of the things they'll have you do when you're like coming out of a Shavasana pose in yoga, wiggle your fingers, wiggle your toes. 
that's embodiment and you have that available to you. Or if I'm being really ableist right now, you can sense into the center of your forehead and just think about that place, the place that you make the number 11 when you, uh, when you furrow your brow, any of these things is, is bodily presence. Mm -hmm. And it's a great place to start because what your nervous system or what, you know, dissociation will essentially try to do is get you to evacuate your body. And little by little, you can, so if I say, start with your neck, start with your shoulders, start with your hands, start with the tip of your nose, wiggle your toes. There is something you can do that can allow you to be in your body right now. Yeah. Um, yeah. What other, what other offerings do you have today? Well, I think the, the primary thing that can help you get into your body after you've done toes and fingers wiggling, if you need something like that, by the way, they also ask you to do that when you're coming out of anesthesia, yeah. so put those side by side. Yeah, um, okay. yeah. I'm sawing from dissociation. Right. Right. So one of the best things you can do for embodiment is to actually just breathe, just breathe. Yeah. And, um, Shelly talked, I think Shelly from melt talked about it a little bit with us, yeah. but, but when you are trying to be aware, like some of us don't know what a breath is for me, I breathed in my bronchioles for years, right? This is also one good reason. Um, exercise is fantastic for dissociation because it makes you get in your body, but understand that when we are in dissociation or trauma, we have muscle constriction, which is what Beth has been talking about. So my takeaways would be number one, 3D breathing. Your rib wall expands up and down, front to back and side to side. Most of us don't. So when you right. take a breath, feel where it's tight, just feel it. You don't have to do anything about it. And I think that might be the thing that is most important if you're doing some embodied work is that a lot of us with go, go getter minds, I just thought go, go gadget arm. <laughs> so I'm totally dating myself there. But for those of, the, of us who go for the intellectualization, we do that to stay out of our bodies. So when yeah. you find the part that's tight, thank it or ask it, whatever you want to ask, and then let it go, move on. Don't nag that part, if yeah. that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Right. And I just want to hop way back to when you were talking about just sitting with yourself for 30 seconds and offer love and compassion to those of you who cannot do that right now. Right. Because that's real. One time, Beth, I was uh, leading a DBT program and um, we one of the things was to sit quietly for 30 minutes. This was by far the most dramatic of my 30. I know I just said 30 minutes. So. <laughs> Thanks for your you made me realize what I said. Um, I have friends who sit still and quiet for 10 days in a row on retreat. So it is possible to do the 30 minutes back to the point, 30 second, just being present, just being quiet. And, um, she ended up throwing up in the garbage can. Yeah. yeah. So if that's you, yeah, we know. Yeah. We gotcha. We yeah. are, we know do what you can do. Maybe 30 seconds is your goal. Yeah. And the, right. you know, yeah, Marilyn Dougal, the, the treasure of our, uh, of our AIT life. Uh, she's a, an AIT practitioner in, I believe, Colorado and Louisiana concurrently. You could probably find her on the internet, Marilyn Dougal and AIT. Um, but she also says that if, if dissociation is a big part of your life, starting with your thinking, starting with a safe place, like your thinking is really okay. Yeah. Um, so that there's not, again, there's not some place where you're, where we've, you can, there's something you should be able to do and you can't do it and you're failing. If you need to be in your thinking mind and listen, listen, if you're already listening to this podcast, maybe pat yourself on the back Yeah. Uh, because it means that you're like, oh shoot, this is a me thing. Cause you can spend, you could spend the rest of your life being like, it's the job, it's the partnership, it's the neighborhood, it's this, it's that. And if you, when you finally go, everything is in me now it is my making and then you decide you want to do something about that that's like taking a level of responsibility for yourself that a lot of people don't do that they don't take in this lifetime and so we honor that um so uh let's do the rubbing your sore spots and then you right. can probably talk me through uh cook's hookup easier than and the medulla under nose hold we'll do all three of those um 
I think so the cook's right. hookup might be a little bit complicated for me to do demonstrating wise because it's hard for me to get my camera on my feet. Do oh you no, you could just, you could talk us through it, okay. but I'll do, uh, yeah, just talk All me right. through it. So this is called rubbing your sore spots. So you can find the hollow of your throat. You can go down about three inches and then out about three inches. Another funny way to do that is you can stretch your arms all the way out and then snap them back in and you'll essentially find the same spot. Um, you can rub in small circles, finding a place that feels either good to rub or it feels tight. Rubbing in small circles and you can repeat after me or you can... Uh, you can make up your own version of this. And Tab, you don't have to repeat after me. Uh, this is just for those out that are listening. So you could say something to the effect of this. Even though I may have blocks that make it hard for me to love myself or to treat my trauma or to be present in my life, I deeply love and accept myself. I honor and respect myself. I forgive myself for having these blocks. I'm learning and growing and I'm doing my best. And that's it. That saying that to yourself, back to that EFT and tapping episode, what you're essentially doing is showing to your nervous system, even though, even though these things are going on, I'm acceptable right now in this moment, the way that I am. There's nothing that needs to change. There's nothing that I need to do differently in this moment. I may be struggling and I'm lovable in this moment. And this is the sort of non-judgmental, unconditional love and presence that you can teach yourself to receive from yourself. It's an inside job. Yeah, it is an inside job. That was a beautiful way to set up both the, um, the reversal area, that's Tinder spot, um, I have a couple things to chime in if you're ready and yeah, then we can move on. on. Okay. All right. So the first is the way that Beth just said that is ideal. Right? Yeah. I want you to know that and 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 what we should be working towards or what we want to be working towards for sure. Right. But I also want to let you know in my practice and in my own life, two other things have worked when rubbing those spots. One is saying nothing. Just be there and rub it. Yeah especially if you don't have words, right? So it's okay. It will work energetically. Yeah. Even if we're not getting, there's that even if, even if we're not getting to the underlying core belief, which is the, right. the next parts, right? So that will work. The second is if you cannot say a beautiful, kind, articulate sentence for yourself while you're rubbing, I have had, I'm, I'm going to go sideways here for a minute. I have had clients who are like, even though this GD bleep, 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 bleep is happening and I bleep, 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 can't handle it, bleep, 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 and I feel like pile boop, but I'm not, that also works. <laughs> so I love that. the point I'm trying, and if you're a kid watching this, even though I failed that test, I'm an okay kid is yeah. crazy, right? Yeah. So yeah. the point here is non-fixing. This is about relaxing into your natural state, not trying to force a way of being. All right. Those were the yeah, things that I wanted to pop in. Yeah. And as you're saying that, I also think, so the whole point is embodiment plus feelings. Right. I'm in my body as I'm feeling what I'm feeling and, I, and I'm verbalizing it. So you've got three points of contact, my feelings, my thoughts, and my body. But the behavior that you're engaging in is like self-soothing. Mm-hmm which is really extraordinary, especially if nobody ever taught you how to do that. And you are, you are teaching yourself thanks to the internet books, podcasts, how to love yourself because you just, if the next time you jump into a dumpster fire of either your own creation or one that's already like a crackling blaze and you're like diving in um, that you could go, even though, even though I got on the merry-go-round with a narcissist, Again, <laughs> I know I'm trying my best. I yes. am learning and growing or like I am more than my choices and wherever it is. So yeah, as it relates to what you say while you're rubbing your sore spots, that part doesn't matter as much as just like cultivating and practicing emotional presence. Yes. This one is very soothing. 100%. And I mean, you are, you are massaging acupuncture or acupressure points, right? And these relate usually to fear. 
here's a pro tip I just want to pass on. If you are not finding those exact points or say that's not, you know that that's not where you need to be rubbing, right? It doesn't feel right to you. That does happen. You can gently palpate your chest. And when you find a tender spot and it's not going to be like, oh my God, I got to go to the hospital, but more like, oh, there it is, right? That kind of spot. That is usually an area where you have neurolymphatic, um, what am I trying to say? Congestion. Mm, mm. And so this is the ideal spot because it's right on an acupoint, but anywhere on your chest will work. And I have had yeah. people all the way out to their armpits. All This is all lymph. Yeah. Right? So yeah. go ahead and do what feels best for you. Beth set you up with the ideal. And I would encourage you to move toward that. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I'm glad to hear you say that. Cause like, uh, sometimes bringing in the, like what's going on in your body for those of you that are intellectualizers or you need, you need the neuroscience. Okay. So then it's lymphatic drainage and then it doesn't have to be like energy, wh whatever. Yeah. Whatever works. And you can just be, you can be in presence. Um, so we're coming up on our time today. What else would you want to add for those that are listening or those that we're, we're working in service of? Um, the last thing I would like to add, two things. One, I think we're out of time for the cook's hookup. So if it's cool with you, Beth, I'll just demonstrate that full body so that people can see it and put it up on our resource page. Yeah, cool. Awesome. So you can go there and see that. And the other thing is, I think it was either the very first or the second podcast where you were asking me for a tip. And I encouraged people to find the space. And I really want to come back to you with dissociation that there is a space that happens between the reaction you're having and the decision you make most of us just jump right over the gap and react and then our decision is same oh same oh as right. it has been this whole time right take that space take that space to massage take that space to um, do some of the focus work that we've been talking about today you deserve that space what yeah. Would you, what would you add, Beth? Yeah. Well, just, just in that, like, where am I in space and time? So Tabitha has said like proprioceptor sense, uh, where am I in space and time? Because sometimes you can literally feel thanks to dissociation, like you're not there. Like there is, there is you watching you as if you were someone else, or there's you sinking into that shame hole, like the hole that just mm -hmm. opened up inside of yourself and you're falling inwards. And then if you go, but where are my feet? Well, your feet are on the ground or where are my hands? Where is my like head in relation to my body? Am I actually three feet above the ground? Am I three feet above my own body or is my head attached to my neck where it is? And um, so when I think about space, it also includes like, and where, you know, where, yeah, where am I? One of the other things I'll ask you to, to add if you're out there, um, there's there's something called the dissociative experiences scale to the des2 it's in the public domain which means that you can take it uh we'll add a link to that on our resource page to the um the self-scoring des but here's a here's a pro tip pro tip folks um your inner critic and your judge and your mind part can be like well yeah but that's not really what this question's asking well you know yeah but you don't really do that give the first answer that comes to your mind, first thought, best thought. Yeah. Because there's the truth. And then there's all parts of you that have worked very hard to protect you from the truth. That's actually, um, some of my clients will get really high DES scores and I'll go, this is pretty high. And they're like, yeah, I guess I dissociate a lot. And then I've got some folks who dissociate a lot and who are so good with social desirability that they know how to answer those questions well so that they are not calling attention to something that's actually an issue. Mm -hmm. So if that's you, that's okay. But this is why the encouragement is first thought, best thought. Because how you do it is like, what percentage of the time do you do something? And if you're like, yeah, I mean, I do sleep eat. But this question is asking if I ever have find evidence that I've done something I don't remember doing. And that's not what I'm doing. <laughs> this is where we lovingly tell you, and you can tell by Beth's face, that be honest with yourself. to be honest with yourself. Be honest with yourself. Right. Yeah. And it's not because there's nothing wrong with a little dissociation. I don't want to feel every second of a six hour drive. We all do it a little bit. It's that. And then if I need it, right. 
It's something that I can consciously, I can compartmentalize my life consciously. Yeah. What we're talking about is if dissociation is running your life and you are being whisked away from your life um, such that you don't actually feel like you have any control over your choices anymore, mm. we want you back. We want you back. We do. Or if you feel like there's no point to living. We want you back. Listen to you back. Listen to our last episode on despair. It's real. It's real. Mm. All right. That should I wrap us up and let people Yeah, know we did that? it. I mean, we love we did do it. We love likes and subscribes. We love feedback. Mm. Um, just a note that if we absolutely love getting emails letting us know that we have helped you and that there is change afoot in your life. Mm-hmm. Please understand we may or may not be able to respond to those emails. Um so just keep that in mind, um, because we certainly don't want to be somebody who abandons or doesn't recognize you. Uh, we just are crammed full in our everyday life. Um, so mm-hmm. the best thing to do is use that form so that your email doesn't get lost. Yep. We look forward to seeing you this season. We're going to be talking about a lot of interesting things. The two topics that are coming to mind for me right now are about spiritual um, or religious abuse and what that is like. And then I, one of my favorites is at the end of our season called, so you've decided to go home for the holidays. <laughs> so you're making the choice to right. go home for the, yeah. The one I'm really looking forward to is responsibility versus blame. I oh, love it. Right. So when we say we want you to be responsible for your life, um, it doesn't. Yeah. Oh, boy. Today's not the day, but clearly right. I'm already feeling pretty hot about it because it's confusing. It's confusing. It is. Um, we're, here to, we're here to walk you through it. We are here to walk you through it. And remember, we walked a lot of parts of this road. So we get it. Sure. We are looking forward to meeting with you and uh, we'll see you in a couple of weeks with our next episode. Have That's a great right. vacation, Beth. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye.